introduction and and um it's um so there's a lot a lot of raptors um and we have like nighttime raptors or owls and then di diurnal raptors or hawks eagles falcons so i've restricted it to the, really the diurnal ones and then i've restricted it a little bit more not including every rare bird or unusual raptor like this rough leg hawk here in the front i'm not going to talk about rough leg hawks I, I can mention them somebody has a question at the end um but i just wanted to you know not have so many species to deal with uh, that we would end up you know overloading so here's here's where we're gonna go um the you know hawks eagles they're really cool birds people really gravitate towards them part part of it is that they're fast they're big you know they've got those eyes the hunter's eyes and um it's no wonder that they they have really you know so many countries so many cultures have some um understanding of raptors uh, as being sort of culturally significant and it even gets into the whole idea of national symbols so the bald eagles you know u.s uh, national symbol in lots of countries i mean mexico is the golden eagle the germans you know all these places that have these eagles hawks uh, various raptors as their natural symbols and uh, you can see why it's like just a uh, uh, birds that somehow give you an idea of confidence and you know being big and that's kind of what we always try to do when we're you know using national symbols we seldom try to choose a sparrow or something that makes us look um small but that's the way it is and recently you might have heard of this stellar seagull that's been cruising around all over parts of canada and the us and wound up in the end in in maine for a good amount of time and was in the news all over the place um, these are stellar seagulls I photographed in Japan in winter, one of the tours that we do, and we're going back in 23. And you see this bird, you can see why the commotion is, is happening. People, you know, flying in from other parts of the U.S. to go see the stellar seagull. It's huge. It's, you know, it's got this big beak, the black and the white coloration, the tail that's pointed, um, and, and just uh, the majesty of, of this thing. So. Um, this is sort of the, the the build up to the fact that we're dealing with birds that have a lot of fans, you know, so ra the, the raptors are, you know, huge fan base. So we have hawks, eagles, falcons, you know, these are diurnal um, raptors. But, you know, one of the interesting things is that so this peregrine falcon here, they're actually for a long time. It was really clear to everybody that falcons, hawks, and so forth were different families, but they were all related to each other. And in fact, the group that that you know it was the falconiforms included the hawks. So the falcon name even applied to in that of that order applied to the hawks and eagles and so forth. Now we know from DNA that the two are not that closely related. And weirdly enough, falcons are more closely related to parrots than they are to a hawk or an eagle. On the other hand, vultures are related to hawks um, and so forth so and vultures at one point people thought they were related to storks maybe so there's been a kind of reshuffling so now when we say diurnal raptors we're actually including two different groups completely different groups and so falcons their hawk-like look is really convergent on on a type because they are hunters so keep that in mind um, and this is relatively new a few years old that information one of the things that really sets aside raptors from a lot of other birds is their amazing uh, sense of vision. And it, it's not only an amazingly acute sense of vision where they, they can see things from a distance and they have sort of this sector of their eye that is much more fine tuned that it, it's, it can see can clear, you know, clearly uh, at a distance. So it's almost like they have little binoculars within their major eye, sort of a section of their eye. Um, and they also have recently found that raptors can see ultraviolet signals from recent urine trails. So if there's a lot of rodents or food in a field, the raptors will actually see the signs of recent activity from, from rodents. So they not only see them really well in order to find them and hunt them, but they can assess a field 
using UV light to whether it's got a lot of food or not as much food. So then you can see why, like when there's a field that has a big boom of, of rodents, the, the, all the hawks just uh, show up, the kites, everybody, everybody shows up, they somehow know. And it's because they can see that, that vision, you know, a special vision of, of kind of a urine trail vision. I won't get too much into this. I, I mean, I'll, I might mention some things that if you're, you know, trying to describe raptors, there are some things that, that you just have uh, come up. One of them is this whole idea of uh, a window. It's a paler area, usually on the outer part of the wing that we call a window. The fingers are these, these um, feathers here that sort of jut out like little fingers. The outer hand of the wing is, are the primaries and the inside are the secondaries. Um, the other uh, bit that that sometimes people talk about is this dark area here at the base of the primaries. Really, it's on the on the greater primary cupboards. If you have a dark area there, it's called a comma. And then for the red tail hog, especially this area here between the head and the bend of the wing, is the patagium. And if it's dark like this, if it's dark like it forms this patch, that's a red tail hog. That's one of the the things that you can look at from below that tells you it's a red, red tail hawk at, at any um, age uh, of, of a red tail. And um, one of the things that's interesting about both the falcon group and the hawk group is that they differ in size. The males and females differ in size. So this here is a, a picture of you know, two occipiters, they're uh, sharp shin hawks. And the female is way bigger than the male. And it's always, that's the pattern in raptors. Females are bigger than males. Similar in owls as well. And it seems to be like the ones that show the biggest difference between males and females are, are bird eaters. The ones that show the least difference in, in, in size are fish eaters. And then in between are the mammal eaters. Why that is, I don't know, but it's a pattern that shows up throughout the world. And um, as far as then when you're trying to identify these things, one of, the, one of the things I think is really a good way to begin is that you have all of these species, right? You have red-tailed hawks and red-shouldered hawks and ferruginous hawks and cooper's hawks, but you try to break them down into groups. And then you also try to have a common species that becomes your reference, the one that you compare others to. And the reason that I pick certain reference species here is because they're, they're also common. So a red-tailed hawk for me is a good reference species for the Buteos, the soaring um, hawks. The um, Cooper's hawk is a good reference species for the bird-eating hawks, what they call the occipiters. And then um, the American kestrel is a really good reference for falcons. And then there's uh, the other big things, eagles and so forth, where you almost don't need a reference species because there's only a couple of them. But red-tailed hawk is what I just showed you. Um, it has this dark patch, patagial patch. And there's a very interesting, to me, general pattern, pattern on the underparts that shows up again and again, and especially in the West, in that we get a darker throat, a paler breast, and a darker belly. So it's like dark, pale, dark, dark, pale, dark. And it's more marked in young birds than adults. And from under the underside of the tail, you actually can't tell very much uh, that it's red, but in, on the other side, on the adults, you'll have a reddish tail. That's why they're called red-tailed hawks. So here, these show up uh, as reddish tailed. And you can see again that they um, have that dark patagial area. And then in these paler morphs, it's again, dark, pale, dark. It's harder to see on the dark ones. And they have this variability of having dark and pale morphs. But again, there's sort of a darker head, a paler breast, a slightly darker belly. Um, and even that darker patagial area that we talk about, it's there in, the, in this um, rufous form. So then when you have these variable um, birds where you can get dark ones and pale ones, learn the pale one, which is the more common one, and learn the shape. Look in those wings, how they, they really are broad. They don't look very pointy, but they sort of spread out into those fingers and this tail's not very long and it can be at times really fan-shaped, almost joining up with the wings. It's a really um, good shape 
uh, sort of tab in your head and you think, okay, so if you see a darker version, maybe that's a red-tailed hawk. If it's the same shape, assume it is, you know, unless they're proven otherwise. And here's some adults. Adults have dark eyes in the red-tailed hawks and you don't always see the red tail. But again, it's like this darker area, paler breast, and then darker belly. This one's a little harder to see, but there's a paler area in the breast there. This is more of a rufous, getting towards a rufous form. And adults have dark eyes. So they're really kind of brown eyes when you get them up close. And it's quite different from the youngsters. The youngsters have yellow eyes, almost whitish yellow eyes. And the youngsters look duller brown overall. But when you see them flying around, you see again that dark, pale, dark, dark, pale, dark. So that pattern Although it's muted sometimes, it's the dark morph sometimes, and you know, it's not always kind of you know useful. Most of the times it's there. So you if you can see that paler breast patch, almost like a shield uh, breastplate that is paler compared to the rest of the either the head or the breast, the, the belly, that's a good sign you're looking at a red tail hawk. And then you can also look for that dark patagial area, and then you've got it basically. Um, there's a, that pale window is kind of rectangular if you, um, if you look at it. So I'll show you later red-shouldered hawks and how they have a slightly different look to that. But um, one thing I wanted to point out that's a little weird is that juvenile youngster hawks have slightly longer feathers on the wing than the adults. So you can see that in this, you have an adult on the left and you have a youngster on the right. The adult looks a little broader wing, not as sort of, you know, pointed or, or narrower as the, the young bird here, especially the tail looks a lot narrower and longer. That's because they have longer feathers. And it's thought that these birds have longer feathers as youngsters because it allows them, in a sense, to have an easier go at learning how to fly. So that's, that's at least the theory. Uh, there's more looks at Red tail hawks, again, dark, pale, dark, dark, pale, dark, patagial area there, and um, works in all ages in general. Um, the juveniles are a little duller. And one thing that really trips people is that it's the red tail hawk. So you look at the tail. You, you're, if a name is telling you to look for something, we always look for it. And it's not always that useful. Names are names. But, you know, there are birds named for features that are really hard to see, like red-bellied woodpecker out east or even a ring-necked duck. There is a ring in there, but you can't see it. So the red-tailed hawk is a juvenile. They have the pale eyes. Remember, this is one of the ways you can tell it's a youngster. They don't have a reddish tail. They have a brownish tail with little dark stripes. So if you don't see a red tail on a bird, it doesn't mean it is, isn't a red tail. It could mean it's a young red tail. So keep that in mind. And... These morphs, this is a much less common than the uh, pale morph, is the rufous morph, which is almost like the, um, um, if you added sort of a, a chestnut color to all of the areas that are pale on the body on a regular red tail hawk, you add chestnut to it and you get this rufous morph. Quite rare is the truly blackish dark morph. Um, don't see this very often. And these are really tough because there's almost no features that tell you it's anything other than as an adult they have red tail otherwise it's the shape that really is useful in identifying the youngsters that tend to look a little more speckled um, but the adults will have the red tail and they'll they'll look really black like this so there's no looking for the dark light dark it's all dark underneath so keep that in mind very rare though um, in terms of niche what these birds do is they feed on other things, but not all hawks are eating rodents. We always think of small mammal type prey, and it's really true for red-tailed hawks, white-tailed kites, harriers. Eagles are, are eating rabbits or ground squirrels, ruginous hawk. But there are some birds that actually like amphibians or reptiles, like red-shouldered hawk. The occipiters, the uh, cooper's hawk and um, the shark shin hawk, like to eat birds. So do peregrine falcon and merlin. And then vultures, of course, are eating dead things. And eagles often eat carrion as well. That's a, especially in winter, they eat a lot of carrion. And you wouldn't think of this, but some raptors eat insects. Swainson's hawk, um, merlins, kestrels, 
And um, this picture here of his osprey, they're really obviously fish dependent, but bald eagle will also eat fish. And sometimes even some other raptors will eat fish. So each one of these primary foods affects where you're gonna find a raptor and what it's gonna look like. Um, I'll tell you about osprey at the end and how its shape really is all about catching fish and eating fish. Here's another reference species, a cooper's hawk, which is a common backyard bird that tends to arrive, especially if you have a bird feeder and everything kind of goes haywire because they're trying to get away from the cooper's hawk. And then um, they're getting away because cooper's hawks eat birds. And they actually, the females, which are bigger, like to eat collared doves. The males eat more sparrowy types uh, size birds. So you can see that the size of the male female difference actually affects what they eat, even though they'll use the same habitats. Um, remember our red tail hawk had those broad, broad wings and then that short tail? Well, accipiters, these um, bird eaters have a very long, long tail and kind of short, short wings. So they look really um, kind of uh, like a tube in their body body shape, and they're highly maneuverable. They actually can fly through, you know, a forest, the middle of the forest, and flip sideways and so forth, and this tail and this wing shape allows them to do that. And they are maneuverable because they chase down birds. They tend to arrive um, in, and surprise them, but then do a little chase to try to catch them. The adult Cooper's hawks, they have this dark cap. This is a really good way to identify them, and then this rusty coloration underneath. Um, if they have gray cheeks, they tend to be males. If they have rusty cheeks, they tend to be females. So that sort of correlates with uh, the uh, difference in males, the sex of the bird. Here's some adults. You can sort of see these ones have more rusty cheeks, but still have this sort of flat-headed look. And then the dark cap. Dark cap tends to be separated from, from the, uh, the back, and it looks darker than the back in most, in most situations. Later, I'll show you Sharpshin hawk as a comparison. Now, young Cooper's hawks are stripy underneath. And think about when we say streaked or striped, we have dark markings that go lengthwise along the body axis. When we say bars, we're actually going crosswise on the, on the body axis. Um, and the, these markings, will look really teardrop shaped off and like very nicely set off and quite dark and really crisp. The shape of the head and so forth is just like the adults. It's just the color's a little different, a long tail. And with Cooper socks, they have a rounded tip tail and a very long rounded tip tail. And when you see them um, uh, well, the tail has actually a broad pale tip, whitish, uh, or grayish white in the adults and paler on the juveniles. And this really broad pale tip is actually a good way to separate them apart from the more rounded tail shape from the sharpshin hawk, which I'll show you later. But Cooper's hawks you see a lot more than sharpshin hawks and throughout the year. So this is why this is a good reference species to use and they're often in backyards, so it helps. Here's the shape, uh, young bird on the right, adult on the left. And one thing to, to look at too is that they have a pretty big head and they often will hold the wings kind of straight. So they look like a kind of cross shape when they go over like a lot of length on the body and tail and their wings straight across and their head really juts out and very straight front part of the wing, rounded tail tip and that here you can see the white tip to that tail. So again, I'll show you the sharpshins later. And then for a falcon reference point, you want to use the American kestrel because it's actually a pretty common falcon. It's actually a little unusual falcon because it eats small rodents and insects more than it eats birds. Well, the other falcons we have eat birds, but they have the typical falcon um, mustache, almost like the little dark area that football players put under their eyes. And the kestrels have two dark bits on, on their face. So there's two stripes, one below the eye and one behind the eye. The males are brighter than the females. So they have these blue wings and red backs. And the females are more brownish and barred on the back and um, very colorful. One of the most colorful birds, uh, raptors we have. And their wings are pointed. That's kind of a classic falcon um, wing shape. So a pointed wing, they'll stripe below the eye and uh, you've got the essence of a falcon. 
Now, kestrels are a longer tail than the other falcons, and they do that kiting behavior that you'll see, you know, they're, they're sort of over the field and sort of st standing still. Um, that is classic of kestrels and white-tailed kites, and I'll show you the kites a little later. But um, here's what females look like with the lots of rusty on the back, the beautiful head colors. And when you see them really well, it's like they have a gray cap with like a like a, a rusty yarmulke right on top. It's kind of cool. You, we don't often look at those patterns in, in detail, but that little rusty bit on top of the gray is it's like an extra added bit. And the, the males are really striking because they have this bluish gray wing and then that fully reddish tails, sometimes with a little black streaking. But the face is very similar between males and females with the two stripes and, um, and uh, you know, general rusty coloration also helps. The, um, I want to sh show you a little bit, you know, so those are three reference species. I'll talk a little bit later about some of the other species that, that you can use them to refer to um, or compare with. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about raptor migration because it's um, there's a, a lot of interest in the in raptor migration in the east. We have fewer spots to watch raptor migration in the west, but I live closer to the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory right at the Golden Gate. You folks might live closer to um, places in the spring that are good raptor um, uh, spots in the in the desert actually uh, going right up sort of Palm Springs area and um, there probably are also some concentration points along the coast but um, it's they're they're a little bit less so than the Golden Gate does here in San Francisco that really concentrates birds they don't like to cross water and that's why peninsulas are great for concentrating raptors but they, they've been tracking raptors for so long now that they have all of this information, like when the juveniles go through, when the adults go through. And um, this, there's a lot going on here. I'll just mention that this is sort of the season in the fall, sort of earlier in the fall, kind of late summer, more into like late fall. And the uh, youngsters here have two peaks and they think that these two peaks are due to sort of um, red tail hawks. These are red tail hawks going through early are more local, sort of California, West Coast, and some of these other ones might be from British Columbia and further inland, Alberta, and so forth. So we have two peaks because they're coming from two completely different places. Now, some places have also tracked raptors with satellite tracking technology. This is an individual that was um, banded in Chile in the desert that flew all the way up to nest in the Arctic on Baffin Island in Canada. And um, they, they had several different individuals that they tracked like this. And what's interesting is that they move north using one route, they move south on this red route. And they seem to track the migration of shorebirds, shorebirds moving north and then shorebirds moving south. Um, so we don't have that kind of tracking info on peregrines here in the West, but um, Eventually we will, I'm sure. In the West too, uh, this is a quite a rare species, broadwing hawk, but they've been tracked. Uh, in, in this case, you can see multiple individuals that were that were banded here at Golden Gate Raptor Observatory and they go right through where you guys are there at some point. There's gotta be like a magic spot somewhere in there along the mountains where these birds are more likely to be found because multiple individuals were using the same routes as they were going down south. So um, interesting. And then the reason they lose them in Mexico is that these were being tracked with kind of radio tracking technology. So once they got to Mexico, they followed them for a little bit, but um, it wasn't a satellite tracking thing. Somebody actually had to be following them in a vehicle <laughs> to, to get this information. And then there's the super uh, migrants like Swainson's hawk that goes from all the way from the US and Canada down to um, specific spots down in, Argentina. So they can be highly mobile and a lot of, you know, a lot more to be determined with our, our birds. But keep in mind that a lot of the ones you see in winter aren't the same ones you're going to see in um, summer. They, they're moving around all over the place. A little um, 
if you now this is a kind of real finicky stuff so but I, it's not mentioned very much and I, I thought i would since i have your attention and you want to learn a little bit about hawks here and their identification those fingers in the in the outer part of the wing if you sort of ignore this outer one this is how i do it i count i i count the big fingers half this the 10th primary is small so you sometimes don't see it so the fingers that show up here are these and there's one two three four yet on this this is the red tail hawk if you look at the the uh broad wing hawk here there's three and this real difference three versus four separates swainson's and broadwing hawk from the other soaring birds of beautios that, that are in this group rough leg hawk right shoulder hawk fruginous red tail hawk so four versus three and that can be useful if you get photographs and you think you see something rare like a broadwing hawk going by but going back to the more common things we had a reference beautio soaring hawk it's the red tail hawk the other one that's really quite abundant in some places is the red shoulder hawk. It's also very bold in color and also vocally. It's, you know, really sounds like a kind of a gull type of, you know, multiple kind of, oh, 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 oh. you know, if you've heard that and it's really loud and you think, what is that thing? And then you see a hawk, it's red shouldered hawk. It's the most vocal of our hawks. But when you see it, it's got all of this zebra striping, the adults like black and white all over. And then Red shoulder is a good name because it, it has this red on the shoulder and you can see it in the flight. There's sort of real rusty look. So not a red tail. It's like a real banded tail on the adult. And um, there's a lot of rusty on the adult. The youngsters are a little browner. Um, but if they fly over, that window is crescent shaped, unlike the more squarish or rectangular shape of the red tail hawk. They also have a not as broad of a wing as the red tail hawk and a longer tail. So the shape is different. So let's go back. Look at this red tail hawk there on the right. How broad that wing is, shorter tail, how this is slimmer on the wing, longer tail. It almost starts reminding you of an occipiter, but not quite. Um, although the goshawk, which we won't talk about because it's quite rare it has a shape more similar to a red shouldered hawk than than you'd expect because it's so big the young uh, red shouldered hawks they um for one thing they do have a lot of when you see them up close they do have a lot of banding on the on the wings and so forth but it's muted compared to the adults and they do have some rusty that's sort of coming in on the wing and sometimes you see this warmth around the head that might sort of say to you, huh, that's a red shouldered hawk. Red shouldered hawk, hawks never have pale eyes. So they, unlike the juvenile red tails with the pale eyes, that's one thing. Um, if you're seeing a bird sitting on a power line, now it could be a red tail or a red shouldered, but you see these two birds are on power lines. Because red shoulders are smaller, lighter than red tails, they're more likely to sit on the power line. The red tail is more likely to sit on the power pole. It's not a rule, but it's sort of a, one of those things that you, you start noticing it. But look underneath. Remember that dark, pale dark of the red tail? You're not seeing that here at all. What you see actually is more streaking on the breast and then actually more of a barring on the belly. So there's a changeover in the pattern from breast to belly, but they, on the whole, if you squint your eyes, it looks like about the same tone of color and darkness. So that alone tells you that's not a red tail hawk. Red tail hawk would have the dark throat, pale breast, darker belly. This doesn't. So that, the dark eyes and so other features, you might see the banded tail and wings will say, huh, red shouldered hawk. Um, here are, these are juveniles too, again, that that crescent shape there, and you can see a lot of banding on the tail. You can see that crescent shape on this window here, lots of banding, even on youngsters, all the way through, never a red tail. And uh, even young ones will start getting the red shoulder. Um, actually, some of them from the nest already have some reddish going on in there. But um, there's a red-shouldered hawk, the 
versus a red tailed hawk juvenile. You can even see the pale eye on the red tailed hawk. But the, the dark, this window in here is much more like a rectangle. Well, here it's just this sort of crescent shape and a lot more banded on a red shoulder than a red tail. So comparison is always useful. Um, if you have winter fields that are really good flat fields, Ferruginous hawk is the one that shows up um, in some play places, not a common hawk. It can be in certain parts of California in the winter, you can see multiple Ferruginous hawks. The Ferruginous means rusty. So it, they're named for the adults' rusty coloration on the back. But look how pale they are in the front. Look how broad shouldered they are. And again, you're not seeing that pattern of dark, pale, dark. You know, you're just seeing a little bit going on. What you do see on a pale Ferruginous hawk is that they have dark pants. You see that little dark area in here? That's the leg, the leggings essentially of this bird. And they're feathered all the way to the feet. Only rough leg hawk and Ferruginous hawks have feathers all the way to the feet in the hawk group. Golden Eagle also does. Um, if you ever see a golden eagle close enough to see that, you're seeing a really good look at a golden eagle. But the uh, Ferruginous hawk has a big head. And if you see the, the gape, the way the bill goes in, it's a huge gape. They actually eat bigger prey than you'd expect for their size. They're eating ground squirrels. They're eating a lot of things that eagles almost, sort of the small end of, of a golden eagle meal. That's what Ferruginous hawk eats. So they have a big mouth in a sense. Um, and that rusty coloration up top, their tail can be pinky rather than red. So that they could, you know, you might say, is that a red tail hawk? It doesn't look, doesn't look quite right. And if you're in a field situation, really open, especially flat valleys and so forth, that's what Ferruginous hawk likes, almost like prairie-like habitat. And um, young ones, uh, these are pale morphs, have a lot of pale going on, and it, the pale actually goes into the primaries, that, like right in there, and then a very bold comma mark, dark comma in there. And you can kind of see their shape is funny in that they're broad in the inner wing and then actually narrow out very quickly to a more pointed wing, unlike a red tail hawk, which is way sort of broad all the way through. So these are pale ferruginous hawks. Um, this is not to be something, you don't got to look at all the details on here. This is a relationship tree of the different hawks. And what I wanted to point out, the important part essentially is up in here, all of these birds are more closely related to each other than they are to the rest of the other ones. And almost every one of these is from Europe or Asia. So from you know, the Japanese hawks to the ones in Europe and so forth. And the two that have feathered legs are rough leg hawk, ferruginous hawk, and also the zone tail hawk from the desert. They're related to the ones in Asia and Europe more closely than they are to the red tail hawk, swainson's, red shoulder, broadwing, which are in totally different groups within the relationship, genetic relationship of the hawks. So when you're looking at a ferruginous hawk, you're really looking at a bird whose ancestors were probably from Asia. They migrated out here and settled in the, you know, in, in the United States and Canada. Um, there are other soaring hawks that I'm not going to mention much, you know, I mean, I've kind of mentioned them before, Broadwing hawk, Swainson's hawk, rough, rough leg hawk, but in the, you know, spirit of keeping it to fewer species, I'll move on to the occipiter. So we really have talked about the Cooper's hawk already, and then there's the Sharpshin. And we think of them as being super similar, but I wanted to mention something about them that's really different in their biology. The Sharpshin hawk over here on the right, their breeding distribution is way farther north and up in the mountains compared to Coopers. So in Alaska, a lot of Northern Canada, you have no Coopers, but you have Sharpshin hawks. So when we see them wintering in our part of California, um, you can see both species in winter, Coopers year round, or maybe you might be able to see some Sharpsons if you're going up into the mountains. But um, they are really quite different in their breeding habitat, with Coopers being more likely to be breeding in deciduous trees and in riparian areas. Sharpshin hawks breed in coniferous uh, forest and really have a, a liking to spruce. So totally different 
yet they look the same. So we think about them or they look similar. And we think about them as being super similar ecologically. They're not. Um, they hunt birds. Um, Sharpshin smaller and much more northern. And this is the Sharpshin here. Remember I showed you that the Coopers had a long tail, the rounded tip. Sharpshins are more squared off. They also have a tendency to hold their wrist of their wing forward so their head doesn't stick out as much from a straight wing. It's like they, they've brought the wing forward and their head's kind of hidden in this little hollow that the wing makes. And those two things are the size, they'll snap your wing beats, smaller head, wings forward, shorter tail that's more squared off are the ways you sort of separate a sharp shin from a Cooper's. Here's Cooper's, right? Bigger head, straighter here. Um, so it really juts out and also longer and more rounded tipped tail. So look at the differences in those shapes. It's subtle and you need to look at a lot of them, but it, it starts kind of eventually getting in, in your birder brain and you will get to a point where you go, huh, I think that was a Sharpie. And then you trust those instincts because if you looked at enough of them, they actually are telling you something. Don't second guess yourself too much with these. In fact, your gut instinct, once you have some experience, often is better than any other way to identify them. You just think that looks like a Cooper's versus that looks like a Sharpshin. The, the young, uh, the juveniles also have more blurry streaking on Sharpshins than the crisp look. And um, their faces, their heads are smaller and their eyes are bigger. So they can look almost like owl eyed or even they look weirdly sort of pigeon face, the Sharpshins, versus the more really serious looking Cooper's Hawk face. But in the adults, the coloration is similar, except the cap doesn't strike you from the back, especially. The cap is not strikingly different than the um, back coloration. They seem to be more uniform, like this one on the left here. And again, kind of wide-eyed, small-headed. And they're called Sharpshin because they have smaller little legs. And you can really see that on this juvenile here not as teardrop shaped underneath. And look at this sort of really sort of squared off look and uh, almost, you know, um, wide eyed um, surprise look that Sharpshins have versus the more austere and um, serious look of a Cooper sock. Now you might think it's silly to, to, to boil down differences in a bird to these almost um, impressions that you get, but they're actually very useful to try to separate them because then when you go, oh, that looks like big, bold eye, small head, you know, it looks kind of a little goofy, probably a Sharpshin hawk. If it looks serious, like almost like I want to be an eagle serious, probably a Cooper's hawk. Um, so yeah, I went through the, some of the differences here. You can see small head, Sharpshin, squared off tail, not as well sort of um, striped with those real teardrop shapes um, underneath. And um, and um, yeah, keep in mind that when they're flying around, they will sometimes take on other shapes if they're turning or flying away from you and so forth. So some of these tendencies I've shown you are general tendencies and they're not absolute rules. But if you watch one if for enough time, they'll revert to their more classic Sharpshin shape versus their more classic Cooper's shapes. Um, the speed demons are the falcons, right? Because they do a lot of chasing. We showed you the kestrel. That's the least fast of the falcons. The ones that are really sort of can boot it are the merlin and the peregrine. Merlin is a small bird about the size of a kestrel, but a lot more uh, muscular, a little bit more stocky and quite a bit darker. So they don't look rusty at all. And they have a very good banded tail. The, um, they they will shoot through sometimes and you, you'll be doing something and completely unexpected. They come out of nowhere and everything disperses and, and they don't go through trees like an occipiter. So if you, if you see a chase from a Merlin or a Peregrine, there's always an open area. So they do not go into the trees usually, but you can see the little falcon type mustache beneath this one and the brown coloration. Um, unlike the kestrel that's more rusty, and then the nicely couple of couple of bands on the tail that vary in, in how strong they are. The bigger version, the fastest bird in the world is the peregrine. 
And the peregrine has a really dark, bold helmet with that mustache underneath. So look at the differences in the face um, pattern on the smaller merlin to the bigger peregrine. And um, this is consistent. Some birds have more pale on the back of the head and you know, on the face and some have more dark. So really some will look more like a full helmet. Others really look like they have uh, just the, the mustache underneath the, the eye and this dark cap, very broad shouldered and gray on the adults, paler blue gray when they're males, a little darker gray when they're females and they're bigger than females. On this really jet fighter shape with the pointed wings and the really thick body and, and a tail that looks wide and strong when they, they pull it in. So they, they really are amazing birds and they'll drop out of nowhere um, and dive on their prey to try to get speed to sort of knock them unconscious and, and kill them. The uh, young peregrines are brown rather than gray, but they still have that bold, bold, dark mustache. They don't necessarily have the full cap. Sometimes they have a, a supercilium, little pale eyebrow, a lot of striping, streaking underneath. And I mentioned that because that can be very similar look to the prairie falcon. Prairie falcons are paler. You see, these are young peregrines, darker, and the big, bold mustache below the eye. Look at prairie, he's got a thin one and a lot of pale white going around in the eye, a lot of paleness underneath and paler brown above. They're also found in different habitats. Prairie falcons are like the uh, falcon equivalent of that Phrygianus hawk. They're in open country, dry grasslands and um, some dry mountain valleys. Peregrines tend to be near coasts and where there's bird concentrations, uh, you know, lakes and so forth. While prairie falcons are looking for larks and sparrows and other things to catch. Here's some more prairie falcon to show you how pale they can be and how the, the pattern in the face is bold, but not nearly what you expect uh, from these like peregrine, right? But um, and when they fly over, the prairie falcons have dark on the underwing, this dark wing pit, all that going through that a peregrine won't have. The peregrine will be uniform on the uh, underside. And finally, we get um, sort of the, the birds that don't fit into the other realm. So we had buteos, we had occipiters, we had falcons. Now this is the vultures, harrier kites, and so forth. Turkey vulture, I think, you know, when they're sitting there and you see the big bald red head or dark head of the, they're young, they, um, it, they're not really sort of a, an identification issue. When they fly, they're actually pretty big and they look headless at times. Keep that in mind. And they hold their wings up in this sort of um, dihedral, which is an angle that's a little elevated and long tail. Believe it or not, they can be confused with golden eagles that also have a long tail um, and will hold their wings as slightly elevated, but they have, eagles always have a big head. The vultures have a small head. So keep that in mind when you're seeing them because most places that have golden eagles also have turkey vultures, right? The kite, here's a picture. I actually, this is not Photoshop. There's a kite with a real kite. And it's thought that the bird kite, that name came before the toy kite. So we named the toy kite for the bird, not the other way around. So they do that um, kiting behavior, what some people call hovering, um, like this one was doing here. And they're beautiful white, gray, and black, just solidly colored. The young ones don't look all that different from the adults, just slight differences. And when you see the, the pattern, they actually have a little dark area on the underwing here, and they have the dark shoulder above. If you see them up close, they have like eyes like the devil, <laughs> really red, um, which you won't notice unless you see them really close and you actually have a good, um, um, you know, scope or something. They have pointed wings, which you would think that would make them similar to falcon, but they're much weaker in their flight style. They're not, they don't have that muscular kind of flight style as opposed to a falcon. So there's the kite. Another one that's in field areas, the kite eats voles a lot, so does the harrier. The harrier um, is, as a male, can be very pale and grayish above 
Uh, females are not. Youngsters are not. Youngsters and females are brown. But this is a, these are males with a lot of white underneath. And all harriers have a white band at the base of the tail on the rump. They all have very long wings, especially the hand, and they hold it up like a dihedral again, like that turkey vulture, but they fly close to the ground because they're looking for their food. And if you see that head that looks like an owl, it's not because they just happen to look like an owl. They have an expanded set of discs around the ear so they can listen for their food. So they, they're the only one of our diurnal raptors that's also really listening a lot for food and they fly close to the ground in order to hear the rustling of the voles and then catch them. These are the more brown youngsters and females. If you get a real good look at a female, they have pale eyes, the, young, uh, the juveniles have dark, dark eyes. And the juveniles are really rusty underneath, almost like pumpkin colored, while the females are brown and streaky. Um, there's, they're also a little bit grayer above than the uh, juveniles. Um, they're, the eagles um, come in, we have two eagles, right? Golden eagle and bald eagle. Uh, the go golden eagle has, um, the name comes from the golden hackles around its, its neck. So this little golden area here. And they have really restricted in general pale areas to them. So they tend to be brown overall. And if you see any pale on the tail or in the wings, those are younger ones. So the juveniles have a lot of white, but it, ha it has to be in very specific areas. So here are bright juvenile young eagles, golden eagles, and they have the pale at the base of the primaries, the fly feathers and base of the tail. So it's all in the base. That is golden eagle. And you can see this other one here too, lots of white there, base of the um, primaries. Eventually when they get older, they might just be a little bit on the tail here. It's kind of all gone from the wings. But uh, later when I showed you the, showed you the young uh, bald eagle, you'll see why that matters. But what I wanted to show you again, this is another one of these things where there's a lot going on. These are relationships of different birds. But what we see as an eagle, right? We think of eagles as being of the same type. All eagles are related to each other maybe, but they're not. Eagle is a, a word that really means big, big hawk. So eagle refers to the size of the thing. And if we look at relationships, here are what we call the sea eagles. The sea eagles are like the, the bald eagle is, or the stellar sea eagle are sea eagles. They're in here. We have to go way out. So a lot of steps of, you know, these are not closely related birds. Here we have the booted eagles, which include the golden eagle. Harpy eagles are different thing altogether. There's serpent eagles, there's other different kinds of eagles. So our two eagles are not closely related to each other. They're just eagles because they are similarly large. Um, so I thought I'd point that out. The other thing in this, in this um, relationship way out here is the osprey. The osprey is considered its own family and the genetics actually suggest that's true. It should, it's really different from all other hawks and eagles. And here's our bald eagle, national bird related to the stellar sea eagle. Um, the adult is crystal clear, white head, white tail, dark body. But when you get the young ones, that's where it's troubling. Yet young uh, bald eagles have a lot of white speckling all over. Have a look at that here, unlike the golden eagle, the white is more focused right at the base of the wings, right at the wing pit. While in the golden, it was way out at the base of the primaries. And also the white is not at the base of the tail, it's kind of speckled throughout the tail. So if you have a lot of white that's all speckly around all over the place and it's, it's right focused in the wing pit area, then you have a bald eagle versus a golden eagle youngster. And then they become progressively more like the adults as they, they age, you know, this is, um, one stage when they're several years old where they have this stripe through the, the, the head that suggests the osprey because the osprey has a stripe through the head and white head and a very funky look. If uh, I had to say like this um, bird has a really uh, crooked wing. They have these big feet that actually have all sorts of scales that are pointed to grip onto fish because these are fish eaters. 
and they can grab a pretty big fish out of the water. And the reason the wings are so long and have that crook is that they can go into the water and hold the wings up out of the water. And because of that bend, the way they can bend the wings, they kind of almost like, you know, really sort of row themselves out into the air with that ability to sort of move the wing in that helicopter fashion, you could say. And that's why they have that funny crook wing and also very long outer wing that they to get themselves out of the water when they're holding a big fish. It's really different from bald eagles that skim the water and will grab a fish, but they don't drop right in the water like an osprey. These are really special birds and how they do things. Well, a sort of whirlwind tour of raptors through with a little bit about the biology, a little bit about how they do things and um, how you separate at least the commoner ones and how to use reference species, ones that you want to learn, you know, throughout the year to help you then find some of the rarer species or how to identify them by using this reference point, right? And um, I'll just end with saying, apart from thank you, and I'll answer questions here in a second, is that I have um, a website that's a membership-based website that's brand new. It's called Birding Your Best Life. We're going to actually do an event tomorrow if you're interested. Go to the birdingyourbestlife.com. Tomorrow we're showing people how it works, but we're, I have a, a big master class on raptors there and owls, and next we're doing sparrows and other things we're incorporating, and a lot of um, interaction too between people and on the on the website, and it's it's closed interaction, so it's not just random people. It's just people talking about birds and so forth, and we keep it to uh, learning and being supportive to uh, learning and understanding and enjoying birds. And also, there's this lifeless podcast that I do with a couple of friends, um, Molly Brown and George Armistead. If you're into podcasts and into birds, lifeless, uh, I'm on there. So I, you you know hear me talk about other things that aren't necessarily bird identification, but sometimes it just uh, having fun with birds. So thanks so much. Um, hopefully that will, I'll stop sharing this so we can see people's faces, I guess. Hopefully that would answer some of your questions on, on raptors and their identification and so forth. Thank you so uh, much. That was so informative. That was, that was really cool. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I actually am totally interested in that podcast. What was it called? Life List. It's Life, Life. List, a birding podcast. Yeah. I'm typing it right now, sorry. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually, we're surprised. We sort of started kind of thinking, oh, this would be fun, but it's become really popular. So it's like, woo. I bet, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, usually I go through the chat and read questions, but we don't seem to have any questions. So I would say if anyone, you know, wants to yeah, mute. Yep. This is Vince, uh, outstanding, absolutely outstanding. Um, Thank you. I'd like to share my screen because I'd like to share something with you, Alvaro. Yeah. Um, so we live up on a hill in, in um, Ventura. And we had a visitor that likes to eat our collared doves, uh -huh. the birds. And I'm going to share what it could be. <laughs> a couple of photos for you. So this is our Cooper's hawk, right? Yeah, looks like a juvenile Cooper's hawk, big head. Yeah, and it looks like and it, what yeah. was cool about it was we got these bands. Oh, oh yeah, it's got a big plastic. Wow, and Did you, does there's it have a number? The, so there was a CA one ninety eight on the orange, and then you could. I looked at the this metal band, and it's like four eighteen. Okay, so, so the funny thing is, I went through the, and the reason why I wanted to share it with you is we went through um, a bunch of emails and a guy from GGRO by the name of Alan Fish yeah. um, said, we thought it was a Sharpie. It turned out it was a coupe. And the guy was like, so cool about, well, you do this, you do that. And I posted it on a Facebook page uh -huh. called um, Birding uh, Ventura and Birding California. Yeah. And controversy. <laughs> It's a Cooper's. And I said, no, it's not. It's a, I mean, it's a Sharpie. I said, no, it's not. And here's why. Bam. So even amongst birders, this is a controversial bird. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's interesting because it does look like a Cooper's to me with uh, that shape there. 
and yeah i i would you know it's interesting but if they had it in the, the hand teardrop, they would have mentioned the teardrop feathers and i think that's my tell yeah it's so right if they had it in the hand they've measured it and they did all these things to sort it out but um yeah it, oh gosh i think that's a cooper's <laughs> yeah and so it is coop and I, met, I went to, they were so cool. I went to banding.gov and it's entered and they haven't gotten back to me. I'm going to email the woman um, and see if I got the location it came from. Apparently somebody came back and said those colors tend to be um, airport banding colors. Um, well, um, if, so, so Alan, it wasn't one of the birds that they banded or, or was? He did not. He did not say. He actually asked me to upload it to the to the band oh, okay. bird site. In, okay, interesting. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I somehow thought they banded it. That's why I thought they had measurements. Okay, so I I get it. Oh, that's that's interesting. They they should eventually. So one of the if it's a juvenile bird, so it's only been around a few months. So it was banded. Who knows? Like maybe in the fall. So maybe a few months ago. Sometimes the biologists aren't that quick on getting the data input. That's, so, what, that's what the woman said. She <laughs> said, I'll bug them now that you uploaded the data. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing is like, uh, yeah, you know, you, to, they have a lot going on. And, and you know, obviously, if you're going to ban, you should put the data in. But um, there's often so many other things that come up on their plate. So eventually it gets in. It'll be all sorted out where they banned it in and all that. But um, you might want to be patient. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll bug them. It's been a couple of months. We got that in, I think, December. Okay. That's great. That's cool. That, awesome. That, awesome talk. <laughs> well, thank you. We do have a couple of questions now in the chat. Let me get back to them. All right. Um, Clara asked, are the osprey the only mostly pescatarian bird? Uh, for for a diurnal raptor, generally yes, but there are some tropical raptors that are also fish. Um, there are fish eagles that are really, um, really f more fish oriented than our own bald eagle, and then there are some other more tropical things that also really like fish or sometimes aquatic snakes and so forth. But it is really truly so specialized on fish that. I've never seen an osprey eat anything except the fish. Most other birds that eat fish, well, like ha hawks will shift. Um, but then of course there's, you know, we have kingfishers and other non-raptor birds that will focus on fish and loons and so forth. So I'm just sort of re replying to the, the raptor aspect to it, but it is the fish specialist, yeah. Oh, let's see here. Um, Cynthia asks, "Do you find that re or sorry, do you find that different color morphs of red tails are regional?" Yeah, um, they are, um, but in really broad levels. So, in for example, in the east of North America, there are basically no dark morphs. There are there are western situation. There are way in the north, maybe like Labrador or parts of northern Quebec, there might be some dark morph eastern birds. But in the west, if you go to um, Alberta, let's say, like on the edge of the Rockies where the Rockies meet the plains, there are a lot of funky looking dark birds and every red tail seems to look different. So there's some places where there, the variability is less and some places where it's more. But for us in California, I think that you tend to see slightly more dark morphs when you go into a little inland on the coast, and we tend to see more dark morphs in winter than we do in summer, like we get migrants. So the answer is yes, but it's really complicated. I don't even know where, how it all fits in. And there is a Facebook group called like the Red Tail Hawk Project or something, and they're cataloging red tail hawk, banded red tail hawks all over the North America and actually photographing them, you can see all the variability. It's really, it's almost too much sometimes. You're like, oh my God, that, that is also a red tail hawk, but yeah. <laughs> nice, well, 
Yeah, I think that was our last question. Unless anyone, you know, feel free to kind of unmute and questions or comments. So I'm seeing there's a bunch of questions about having access to the recording. Um, we are uh, uh, going to post it to our website, probably not tomorrow, but um, we, we can get it up on our website within a week. And I, I also think there's no reason why we couldn't post um, links to some of the things um, Alvaro was talking about, like his podcast and um, maybe you know to your website and stuff. Because I, I think I think it would be a cool resource for 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 burners um, that we could make sure everybody has access to. I, I got a quick question, uh, huh? Alvaro. Thanks for a great talk. That was cool. I, I'm wondering, um, have you seen um, in areas? Like a lot of our developed areas where we've seen growing, you know, crows, ravens, these these sort of corvid populations growing. Do you see? Have you seen any up by Morro Bay or anywhere displacement of some of the smaller raptor species, or or not so much? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an interesting question. I don't know that it it correlates, but there's often like crows crow populations grow when there's more urbanization yeah. or at least like uh, urban true. slash yeah. agriculture you know or, but urbanization definitely helps some raptors of some kinds and it does not with others right, right. urbanization and ferruginous hawks don't mix at all you know um yet sometimes you i i think kestrels really suffer from habitat change and also pesticide use and all sorts of things so they're they used to be way more common there today and they might correlate somehow with like crow numbers but i don't think they affect each other directly they're like indirectly correlated because of habitat land use changes but cool. crows themselves driving the raptors out i don't think it happens that much um and uh yeah sometimes but yeah, there is, there's an effect. It just, uh, it's complicated, I think. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. We have some more questions in the chat. Um, Brenda asked, did the young osprey have blue eyes? Yeah, they, they have like a bluish tinge to the eyes, at least as early, if I remember right. And then they go yellow later on. I think that's how it works. And also like some some birds, the uh, like waxy area around the base of the bill changes when they're young, like peregrine falcons have a blue uh, sear, they call it, around the nostrils, and it goes yellow when they're adults. So there's a lot of um, changes in, in colors of eyes and colors of sometimes soft parts um, in raptors. Some of those things are thought to be communication that's really close level communication. So if you look at a um, Cooper Sox eyes and they're not quite fully red, you might be able to say, ah, you're like a two year, if you're another Cooper Sox, you're not, you're sort of a youngster, you're a teenager, you're a young adult. And that might have an effect on who they want to breed with just because younger raptors have less experience and experience is what you need to bring in the food <laughs> to the nest. So. There's probably some real close and very specific information in those eye colors. So I just put the link to um, Albero's website in, in the chat. Um, there's also a couple questions about, about that. So um, you can, you can uh, hook up with that directly. All right. Any more, any more questions? Yeah, I have one more. Um, can you explain? So when osprey dive and they grab the prey, it seems to me that they orient the prey in a more air in the most aerodynamic way they can. I've seen them take mm -hmm. you know twelve inch fish and they align it with their body as they're flying. Um, is that on purpose and is that for aerodynamic purposes? Yeah. Um, it's, it, it is, and they, apart from the, the wings that have the crook and sort of the real almost ability to, to move in probably a, a wider <laughs> um, orbit, you know, from each joint, I think their legs also have that. So you'll see that they'll, they'll come out of the water and sometimes the fish will be only on 
hooked with one talon and they'll they can sort of orient their legs a little sideways like they and they'll move the other leg back and kind of put the fish in 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 the orientation towards where they're flying so it's a more aerodynamic eagles fish eagles don't do this they they flop over to you know sort of sideways and kind of get to a, a perch and then start eating it while osprey will sometimes travel a good long distance with the fish back to the nesting area so and they take bigger fish when they're nesting sort of the further away they are from the nest there's sort of a tendency to take bring the biggest fish because it's more worthwhile for that trip you know in the sense of a the uh calories per calorie <laughs> sense and yeah they they orient them um and almost always when i see this it's head first it's not always but that might actually be balance as well because the, the the fish is heavier in the front part than the back so you're trying to fly with this big thing that that is tilting you off balance and the aerodynamics and how they do that all like with they can only do it with the fact that their their talents are so specialized to grip onto fish that they can fiddle eagles don't have as the, that grippiness so they have to just go with whatever they just take the fish and go with it but osprey are so fish evolved to be fish eaters that they have a completely different way of doing things Sorry, it's a long-winded answer. But. <laughs> um, I like ospreys. <laughs> yeah, that makes me want to go out and find an osprey and look at them. <laughs> I've um, seen a lot along the, the Rogue River in Oregon growing up. Yeah. And, yeah, we, and see, in, we see them out at Ormond a lot too. It, it's amazing how common they are in the east, like along the you know Florida or up to even Massachusetts. And it's a you know they're really common out there. And I think it's they don't do well with choppy, choppy water. So here in the west, we need you know they they'll take um, lakes and rivers, but they're not they're not fishing much on the coast. You know, our, our waters tend to be too choppy, but on the east, they have much calmer water than we do. Yeah, funny story. I was on, a, so we have a promenade in Ventura, and it's a good surf spot in the shore break. And I remember watching an osprey, and they'll, they'll do that hover, fly, hover, fly, hover. He dove, he pulled out of his dive, adjusted it, made a 90 degree right angle, went perpendicular to the wave and snatched a perch and came out. Wow. And I was kicking myself because I didn't have my camera. So they, I, I find they're very agile animals. You know, they, they do those micro adjustments as they, yeah. as they align themselves. It's really like cool stuff. Yeah. And very long legs too, you know, in order to sort of really reach, reach in there and get those fish. <laughs> we used to live on uh, the rivers in Maryland um, oh, not too long ago. And the uh, bald eagles would come in in the winter time and they just occupy it, you know, the, the, like the, um, around the Patuxet. And then in the summer, the osprey would come back and boy, they hated bald eagles. And <laughs> the battles we would have in the spring yeah. between the bald eagles and the osprey were just epic. And uh, osprey would always win. They'd always ch chase these huge bald eagles away and they just move in and, and, and nest, you know, until migration time. Wow. And, you know, the, the, the eagles, um, I wonder if anybody studied how the fact that the eagles really had a resurgence, you know, in the last 30, 30, 40 years, if how they've, if they affected osprey populations at all, how that's worked out, because they, they do share habitat and fish, but they don't, they're not completely the same, right? There, there's differences in there. Um, having these two birds sort of around means that you have a lot of fish, which is sort of a healthy ecosystem type uh, sign, right? So, and I think both here we're in California, we're getting an increase in both osprey and bald eagles. Like we're a little behind. Like they haven't co quite come back. But for me, uh, living here the last couple of decades, bald eagle used to be super rare. Now we see them every year more and more. So it's, they're coming coming back. I, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. I put I put the other the 
the website that has sort of the uh, birding education type stuff and classes, birding your best life, because somebody asked, I think, earlier there. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we can grab that off of off of the chat and put that on our website too. Um, can I, yeah, I have your web, I have your 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 main website in here. So it actually, Alvaro, if there's any other um, things we can link to that that you're involved in, go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll pull that off. Oh, that's great. Thanks for okay. yeah, you know, hopefully somebody will be interested in that and kind of get the sense for how I teach things. So it's mm -hmm. to, to, you know, so. I, I try not to overwhelm and, and use a lot of, <laughs> also, uh, you know, I know it's not easy, all this bird identification stuff. So repetition is really good for people just to hear the stuff over and over and over again. So out on the podcast, yeah, oh, I, I can send you the podcast link, but uh, you can look it up. It's on, um, it's yeah, not. it's on, you know, the Apple Gosh, I don't have it. Right now. Let me try to find it. But, uh, I'll probably get all lost here if I try to find it, but I can send it to you later. <laughs> I found it, yeah. It looks like this. Yeah. Thank you. Life, life list. We get into all sorts of topics. Always looking for more podcasts for my drives to work. So <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, um, thanks so much for inviting me, Estelle, for suggesting me, and I'd be happy next year to come back and talk to you about something completely different. You know, it could be, you know, birding in different parts of the world or other aspects of bird identification or ecologies. So totally happy to do that. Yeah, that would be awesome. We would really love that. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I think I'm going to we'll, we'll, um, hang up the uh, presentation uh, and let everybody kind of trickle out. So um, thanks again, Alvera. It was, it was awesome talk, talk. And, you know, we had a really good turnout. So really appreciate thank it. you. That's thanks a lot. It was fun. It's fun. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Okay, bye. bye. Cynthia, should I stop the recording? Yeah, stop the recording. <laughs>